at this point in the United States, democracy is not really democratic. Almost all voters were white male landowners. But between 1820 and 1850, this started to change. Not for people of color or women, no, just for poor people. State legislators lowered property qualifications for voting, which allowed many more people to vote, as long as they were, you know, both white and male. So getting rid of property requirements probably is why Andrew Jackson got elected. You recall America's mostly fake victory in the War of 1812? And the collapse of the Federalist Party ushered in the era of good feelings, which was another way of saying that there was a basic agreement on most domestic policies. During this time, President Monroe made a speech proposing that Europe shouldn't try to retake colonies in the Western Hemisphere. And if they did, America would like do stuff. This so-called Monroe Doctrine also said that the U.S. would stay out of European wars. <laughs> That's hilarious. The last good feelings era president was John Quincy Adams. He is one of my favorites. He actually wrote the Monroe Doctrine. John Quincy Adams was the son of John Adams. Quincy wanted black, Native American, and women's rights. He had a good mama in Abigail, and she taught her baby right. He was a great diplomat, and his unique upbringing made him one of the most qualified and educated man to ever run for president. Now, if you were looking for the exact opposite of John Quincy Adams, it was Andrew Jackson. When we last caught up with Jackson, he was winning the Battle of New Orleans shortly after the end of the War of 1812. He continued fighting Indians and runaway slaves in Florida, although he was not authorized to do so. Florida still belonged to Spain at that time, so Jackson was invading another country. But for some reason, many Americans did not care, and Jackson became so popular from all of his Indian killing that he decided to run for president in 1824. The election of 1824 was very close, but John Quincy Adams was eventually declared the winner. Four years later, in 1828, Jackson ran a much more negative campaign. One with a campaign that slogan that said, Vote for Andrew Jackson who can fight, not John Quincy Adams who can write. Adams supporters responded by arguing that maybe having a literate president wasn't such a bad thing, and also accusing Jackson of being a murderer, which he was. He had a frequent habit of dueling and massacring, Jackson was involved in between 13 to 100 duels in his lifetime. One of those duels, he was shot in the chest, and that bullet stayed inside him his entire life. He was called Old Hickory because it was said that he would beat anyone who disagreed with him with a hickory stick. So as you can see, the quality of discourse in American political campaigning has come a long way. Anyway, Jackson won. Jackson won because he was seen as a champion of the common man, and in a way he was. He had little formal schooling, and in some ways he was a self-made man, you know, if you can forget that his entire fortune came from his work in the slave trade. And he was not a great slave master. When one of his slaves escaped, Jackson offered a $3,000 reward to the man who could catch his slave and give him 300 lashes. Anyway, Jackson was now the face of the new Democratic Party. These Democrats generally tended to be lower to middle class men, usually farmers. When Jackson moved into the White House, he held a party where everybody was invited. Now imagine a college frat party and you get the picture of what this party turned into a riot was like. People were swinging from the chandeliers, windows were broken. The elites in Washington DC were shocked to say the least. The opposition party, the Whigs, felt that Andrew Jackson was grabbing so much power for the executive branch that he was turning himself into King Andrew. So Jackson's policies must have been pretty outrageous for them to spawn an entire new political party. Now what did Jackson do as president? Let's start with nullification. So in 1828, Congress passed the Tariff of 1828, great name. 
Jackson supported this, but one state, South Carolina, did not like it because they had all their money in slavery, not in manufacturing. So South Carolina was like, yeah, we are just going to ignore that tariff. Jackson didn't take kindly to this because it was an affront to federal power. They lowered the tariff in 1832, but South Carolina nullified it yet again. Jackson responded by getting Congress to pass the Force Act, which authorized him to use the Army and Navy to collect taxes. Wow, this sounds very familiar. The other thing Jackson is known for is the Native Americans, because much of Jackson's reputation there was based on killing them. So it's no surprise that he supported Southern state efforts in stealing Native American lands and forcing them to move. This support was formalized in the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which Jackson supported. The law forced the Cherokees, the Chickasaws, Creek, and Seminole Indians from their homes in Georgia, North Carolina, Florida, Mississippi, and Alabama. In response, Christian missionaries to the Cherokee tribes sued the government, and the Supreme Court ruled in their favor. The removal of the Cherokees violated the treaties that the federal government made with them. They had a right to their land. Now, way to go, Supreme Court. That was a great decision you made. It would have been terrible if you had to carry that out and American reputation would be soiled and like... Wait, what did Jackson do? Jackson ignored the Supreme Court and went ahead with the forced removal sending in the army to force these Native Americans out of their homes at gunpoint. They were only allowed to take the clothes on their backs. Their homes were left to plunderers, and at least a quarter of the 18,000 natives died during the forced march that came to be known as the Trail of Tears. Today, many Native Americans refuse to even use the $20 bill because it has Andrew Jackson's face on it. For someone who is said to be a champion of democracy, he committed a whole lot of crimes against it. Jackson encouraged the burning of abolition literature, you know, books about freeing slaves. Now, burning books, never a good sign. He is somewhat of an enigma. He is both a patriot and a traitor. A renowned general, yet ignorant of war. He's a statesman, yet never wrote or said anything of significance. He had no tolerance for slaves, contempt for women, and he was merciless to Indians. 